Hello everybody, today we're going to talk about the glomerulus. Um, we're going to have a continuation of our discussion of kidney diseases. Uh, the glomerulus is very pertinent to understanding kidney diseases. We're not going to talk so much about normal kidney physiology. There's a lot of YouTube videos uploaded, particularly by Dr. Najib. He does an excellent job of working you through the normal physiology of the kidney and the nephron. If you have not watched his lectures, I really encourage you uh, to look them up uh, on YouTube. So as we talk about uh, glomerular diseases, we need to understand the normal anatomy of the glomerulus okay, in order to break down the pathophysiology. This is really important because um, a lot of diseases are stimulated by immune complex deposition in the glomerulus. And depending on where exactly in the glomerulus these immune complexes are deposited uh, depends very much on the disease progress. It gives us uh, diagnostic uh, indicators, prognostic indicators, um, and it determines the way that we treat patients. Uh, so these are very important to understand, so I'm just going to very quickly break down uh, the different layers of the glomerular anatomy. Okay, so the very first layer that you should know about is the endothelium. Okay, the endothelium is very important. Um, it forms the inner layer, okay, and it's fenestrated. Fenestrated means it just has holes in it. It allows uh, macromolecules uh, to pass through. Um, this fenestrated capillaries also have heparin uh, sulfate proteoglycan, which is negatively charged. The next layer of the glomerulus is the basement membrane. This is a very important uh, layer. Uh, this is composed of type 4 collagen, and heparin sulfate proteoglycan. As I said before, heparin sulfate proteoglycan is negatively charged. Why is it important that it's negatively charged? Because negative charges oppose other negative charges. And it so happens that albumin and other proteins are negatively charged. Okay, So it's negative charge in conjunction with the uh, type 4 collagen uh, helps to restrict proteins and large macromolecules from passing through the glomerulus. Okay, the next layer of the glomerulus uh, after the basement membrane, membrane is the podocyte. Okay, the podocyte has these uh, slit diaphragms, okay, so they're not quite fenestrated. Um, they have these uh, kind of uh, strips, they're called diaphragms, uh, and these diaphragms are made up of sialoglycoproteins which are also negatively charged. And it provides another negative charge barrier for proteins and other negatively charged molecules to get through okay, the glomerular basement membrane, the glomerulus itself. All right, the next layer is really important as well. It's called the mesangial. Okay? Uh, the mesangial cells um, are located in the glomerulus, and they play an important role. They are directly next to the endothelium. There is no barrier between the mesangial cells and the epithelial cells, endothelium cells, I'm sorry. Uh, so what this means is that macromolecules can easily flow into the mesangial cells, okay? Uh, the mesangial cells uh, are twofold important, okay? Uh, they include macrophages, okay? And they also include cells that can secrete uh, cytokines and prostaglandins. Okay, uh, so this is very important. If we have increased glomerular pressure or increased flow into the glomerulus, okay, you're going to have more macromolecules able to freely enter uh, the mesangial cells. Okay, so say we have IgM that happens to freely filter into the mesangium. Okay, we have just a ton of uh, additional uh, macromolecules. Okay, this IgM is now persistent in the mesangial cells and can simulate those cells to release cytokine in an inflammatory response. And you can see how this can be devastating to the glomerulus. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. So these are just the basic anatomical components of the glomerulus. So in a normal functioning glomerulus, okay, we're going to go all the way back to understanding just basic urinalysis studies, okay? In a normal functioning kidney, okay, you're going to have very little proteins. You're going to have less than 20, okay, uh, milligrams of protein per day, okay? If you have more than that, you have a problem, okay? If it's 30 to 300 milligrams per day, you have microalbuminuria. If it's greater than 300 milligrams per day, you have macro uh, albuminuria, okay? Also, uh, the glomerulus should be stopping red blood cells um, and other uh, blood cells from uh, moving past, okay, the glomerulus. 
And so when you look at uh, kind of urine under microscope, you should have less than like zero like to two uh, red blood cells or white blood cells per high power field. If you have more than this, okay, you have some type of pathologic process going on in the kidneys, okay? Is this in the glomerulus? Is this in the kidney itself? Um, there's diagnostic things that can tell us about that. Right now, we're specifically focusing on the glomerulus, okay? Uh, so when we talk about the pathophysiology of the glomerulus, we need to understand that there's this two-hit hypothesis, okay? There is this understanding that there is some type of genetic predisposition uh, for having some type of immunologic response okay, to an environmental factor, okay, whether that be um, some type of infectious process, whether that be some type of immune complex deposition, connective tissue disease, whatsoever you have it, uh, there's multiple factors that go into uh, the progression of the pathophysiology of glomerular disease. So there are two main processes related to glomerular nephritis. The first one is an inflammatory process, okay? The deposition of immune complexes, okay, in the glomerulus leading to inflammation, okay? The second process is an immune-related process, okay? The release of cytokines, okay, that alter the function of the glomerulus. Remember I said the mesangial cells have the ability to produce, secrete cytokines? That's important. That's real important. Okay, so let's break this down even further. Okay, remember I talked about how we had the anatomy and based upon the location of the anatomy, uh, the location where the disease process of, takes place is important. Okay, well let's think about the endothelium first. Okay, if you have immune complexes, okay, deposited in the endothelium, okay, endothelium, right, all those immune complexes, okay, are susceptible to blood-borne factors, okay. If you have IgM, it's susceptible to complement, okay? This complement, IgM, can be destructive to the glomerulus, okay? Now let's take it to the next level, okay? If I have immune complexes deposited in the glomerular basement membrane, okay? A little bit of the glomerular basement membrane is susceptible to bloodborne factors, but not as much as endothelium, right? So if I have immune complexes deposited in the glomerular basement membrane, I'm going to expect that the prognosis of the disease, okay, or the prognosis of this problem is going to be less severe than if I had something wrong with endothelium. 